I've got to apologise, first of all, to all my viewers, because um, uh, on Monday night when I did the West Ham Weekly, I was asked questions about this potential uh, buyout um, that uh, has been rumoured over the last few days. And I cheated because I cut a snapshot of the uh, of the Monday West Ham Weekly show and put it on YouTube uh, for you all to watch. So I apologise for that. This is the proper version of the question I was asked about um, a potential buyout of West Ham United. Um, now, obviously, I'm sure you've heard uh, the stories already in uh, various social media columns and so on. So this is my understanding of it. So let's start with this. I guess it's going to come as no surprise to anybody that Middle Eastern consortiums and some of the richest people on the planet from that part of the world are continuing to invest heavily in football clubs, especially in Europe. When you look at the money that's being generated, especially from European clubs, um, it, the, the, the top 20 clubs in Europe alone, you can see why football continues to be such a big commodity. I mean, since uh, 2016 up to 2023, you can see the income increase uh, uh, every, every year with a slight drop when we had COVID, of course, with uh, um, uh, fans being unable to attend uh, games and so on and so forth. But it's since picked up and it's picked up quite uh, substantially since then. You know, TV revenue mon money, gate money, and of course, uh, all the money that's um, made out of uh, shirt sales and, and all other products related to football clubs. So with an ever-increasing change to our beautiful game, it doesn't look like as if the money-making football tree is going to collapse anytime soon. Nine of the 20 uh, top European clubs have got some kind of investment from, it, from the Middle East. And this trend is expected to continue as time goes by. For example, Real Madrid, they've got huge uh, contracts with mid, uh, Middle East deals. Uh, such a, uh, and, and because of that, they've actually eclipsed Manchester City to become the highest revenue generating football club in 2022-23 season. And that's the first time they've got back to the top since 2017 and 2018. Now, Real Madrid uh, last, last uh, year uh, made 831 million euros in revenue. And that's an increase of 118 million revenue, uh, um, 118 million uh, euros in the previous year. And the club's growth is largely attributed to strong retail performance, as I've just kind of mentioned, and higher stadium attendances. Uh, and and they, we know that uh, up until then, it was Manchester City that was the biggest income uh, revenue earner, but they've topped that. But we know Manchester City have got uh, uh, links to the Middle East. Uh, they're owned by City Football Group, a holding company with a majority, majority stake, which is owned by the Abu Dhabi United Group. Uh, of course, we've got other clubs. Paris Saint-Germain is owned by Qatar Sports Investment. Uh, Bayern Munich, for example, have got shirt deals uh, with uh, Qatar Airways. Uh, Arsenal, shirt deals with the Emirates. Uh, AC Milan, sponsorship deal, shirt sponsorship deals with the Emirates as well. And of course, as we know, Newcastle United uh, is now owned by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, uh, uh, fund who uh, in acquired an 80% share of the club in 2021. So the money is awash there. You know, Gulf nations realize the influence and the power that European football provides. And their continued com uh, uh, commitment to sponsorship and investing in football teams will continue to grow in the coming years. Now, buried amongst these 20 giants uh, in European football is a club which started off its life in the heart of the East End. Uh, and of course, that's our very own West Ham United. According to Deloitte's, last year in 2022-23, we uh, generated revenues of over £275 million. That's the 18th highest revenue stream amongst clubs in Europe. So for many investors out there, we could be a very viable business proposition. So it comes as no surprise that we heard rumours last week 
that Karen Brady was apparently over in the Middle East speaking to potential investors. Now, what kind of investment was she uh, discussing? Look, I'm guessing we all think it's an investment to uh, looking for investors to buy into the club. But it could also be anything like a shirt sponsorship deal. Look, uh, as we know, the government has in the past hinted that all betting companies could soon be banned from sponsoring football clubs. So it wouldn't be at all surprising if Brady was planning a deal that could see us bringing in a new shirt sponsor. Betway, who have been with us since 2015, their sponsorship deal expires in 2025. But as I've mentioned, with the threat of government legislation, uh, that could maybe uh, come to an end a little bit sooner. Now, will Cameron Brady have gone all the way to the Middle East to look for investors, shirt sponsor investors? I'm not quite sure, to be quite honest with you. It's very, it, it's very likely that Brady was out there looking not just for mere shirt sponsorship deals, but for something like a, an awful lot bigger uh, related to West Ham United. And that, of course, is a potential uh, investor in the club who could become a little bit more than just an investor like Krotinski was uh, a few years back, where Krotinski, despite owning 27% stake in West Ham United, is not really interested in controlling uh, how West Ham United uh, works. You know, he, he, he's, he, he hardly attends any board meetings. He's got his advisors there uh, on his behalf. And he's kind of almost like a silent investor. He doesn't get much involved in uh, the running of the football club. Uh, but uh, it could be that with potential changes coming up, that uh, we'll be looking at an investor in a completely different way. Look, um, it's uh, we know that uh, there are 10% share, uh, shares already on sale uh, with regards to uh, Vanessa Gold, who when she inherited uh, the uh, gold shares in West Ham United. Uh, she went look. Uh, she had put ten percent stake out there to be sold. Now, so far, we don't believe anything has materialised from that. We don't believe that uh, there have been successful bidders for those ten percent shares. And one of the reasons suggested for that is because ten percent, you know, it will get you an investment in the club, but it won't give you a controlling sort of uh, investment. It won't give you control of how the club works which is why apparently uh, the shares have not uh, sold that rapidly. Uh, and then because of that, that's where maybe there's been a change in, in stance by the West Ham board overall. They want to uh, bring more money into the club, just like they did with Kretinsky a few years back. And they are looking at potential lucrative uh, deals in the Middle East. But uh, in order to make it more attractive, Instead of just trying to sell the 10% shares that uh, Vanessa Gold has got, um, there's a possibility that some of the shareholders will reduce their sharehold in order to create a 25% controlling stake in West Ham United. Um, now, interestingly, at this moment in time, the current shares are spread across uh, as follows. David Sullivan, 38.8%. Daniel Kretinsky, 27%. The Gold family, 25.1%. Trip Smith, who was on a meeting with um, Declan Rice the other day, uh, had dinner with him. We don't know why. He's got 8%. And then Terry Brown and Daniel Harris have got 1.1% between them. Um, now, if, that's, uh, if they are looking at potentially reducing their sharehold in order to create a 25% uh, 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 controlling stake, uh, that means that someone has got to sell some of their shares. David Sullivan, for example, could be selling maybe 13.8%. Daniel Kretinsky selling just 2%. And the Gold family reducing their sharehold by 9.2% with potentially Trip Smith and Terry Brown and Daniel Harris with no changes. Now, that would mean that um, a potential owner, a potential investor in West Ham United, if the club is still valued at around £870 million, which is what has been what it was valued at last year, it means that an investor would have to spend about £217, £217 and a half million pounds to purchase a 25% stake. Now, if David Sullivan was to sell 13.8%, he would make a tidy profit of around £121 million. Daniel Kretinsky, if he sold his 2% stake, 
he could make a tidy 17.4 million pounds. And the Gold family, selling just under the 10% that they wanted to sell at, say, 9.2%, they could bring that could bring them in a potential profit of 80 million. Now, will any of these um, current uh, shareholders sell their stake? It's quite possible. Kratinsky, we know, is there purely to make a profit. Uh, we've known that for quite some time. Otherwise, he would have just bought the 10% stake that Vanessa Gold has had available. Uh, Vanessa Gold could be tempted to sell even more shares. Um, so the 9.2 might be a starting point for her. You know, it's possible that the smaller shareholders, maybe Trip Smith and maybe um, uh, Daniel Harris, etc., could sell a bit of their uh, stake rather than uh, uh, the, the gold family selling as much as 9.2% in order for them to make a little bit of a profit as well. We don't know. It's all speculation. But uh, if we are looking for investment from the Middle East, the one thing that David Sullivan has always maintained in the past is that he will only sell the club to someone or sell a st uh, controlling stake uh, to someone. Someone who can actually take the club forward is what he said in the past. Now, as already demonstrated, there are quite a number of Middle East investors, shareholders who own or some or all of some of the biggest clubs around, Real Madrid, uh, as I've said, Paris Saint-Germain, et cetera, et cetera. Or they've made investments into those sorts of clubs. So if David Sullivan is going to reduce his stakehold, and if uh, Kratinsky is as well, in order to create that 25% controlling stakehold, um, they're going to be looking for someone who's going to have a serious interest in football clubs, not just as a plaything, but something that uh, a potential future investor is going to sort of do something with West Ham United, have a proper interest, a proper control. And one of those names that has been banded around, which was banded around in the past, is Sheikh Yazim of uh, Qatar. Uh, he was, of course, um, wanted to buy Manchester United. But, of course, uh, Sir Ratcliffe bought, uh, uh, got his 25% controlling stake. So we know Yaz uh, Yazim wants to get uh, a, a decent stakehold in a football club. And if we can offer him a 25% controlling stake, this might be an awful lot cheaper than what um, uh, Ratcliffe played for Man United's 25% stake. But it could be something that uh, y Yazim might be interested in. You've got to think about West Ham United. You know, we're based in a <laughs> one of the best uh, um, cities in the, in the world, London. Uh, West Ham United, with our recent success over the last few years, have become a, a, a more attractive proposition. And of course, we play in the Premier League, the best league in the world. So it could be something that might tempt him. It's quite possible. Um and I'm sure, you know, if if uh, someone like Yazim is really interested in a club, uh, to, to buy into a club, then why not West Ham? Um, it's going to be interesting to see because what may happen there, of course, is there'll be investment in the in the uh, in 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 the squad. There'll be investment in the infrastructure of West Ham, and of course, there may also be investment in the London Stadium to redevelop it, which many fans would like to see. Is there a time frame for all this? Well, here's the interesting thing that it's been suggested that um, they want this deal done by around about May, June of this year. That's pretty fast. That's pretty quick. And that's maybe why Brady was out in the Middle East in order to discuss uh, the fine details of any such deal. It seems quite rapid, quite quick. And why would it why would it be so? Well, one of the suggestions is, is that uh, David Sullivan, 75 years of age now, maybe wants to take a bit more of a back seat, but still some control in West Ham United. And by doing that, you know, you've seen the figures that I mentioned uh, a moment ago, what uh, people could earn out of this uh, sale. David Sullivan relinquishing 13.8% of his uh, um, current uh, stake would bring him down to 25%. He'll make a profit of £121 million. That's a nice little learner to go and uh, maybe go abroad and become uh, re and retire out, out somewhere else. Uh, Daniel Kutinsky, in order to reduce his stake to 25%, will only have to sell 2%, but that will make him a tidy profit. He's an investor. You know, bringing in £17 million is probably back uh, uh, pocket money for him, but it's still £17 million. And of course, the Gold family, who don't necessarily seem to want to 
continue uh, keeping a controlling stake in the club. Like I said, um, you know, uh, Vanessa Gold is already looking to sell 10% of uh, the stake that she got, that she's currently got. So 9.2 would also bring a tidy return on investment for her as well, or for the Gold family as well. So the time frame is interesting um, in order to get it done by June. I mean, you know, we do have FFP. It doesn't matter how rich uh, any future owner might be. They still got to abide by FFP rules, etc. But I guess it will make, uh, I guess, investing in the infrastructure. We're looking at potentially buying uh, some grounds uh, that's been mentioned a few times before in, in order to have uh, new training facilities. What a time to do it. Bringing in two hundred million pounds in order to pay for that and 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 pay for uh, the infrastructure being built at a training ground uh, couldn't come at a better time. And then you know other people will make a bit of money and walk away into the sunset. It's all rather interesting. It's all rather intriguing. I guess all we have to do now is just watch this space and see what happens in the near future. <laughs>